you are in the art world. Tonight, the art talk is delighted to start the new year with this inspiring art talk on art collectors and their uh, participation within public spaces. This art talk would like to highlight the uh, present local global shift in, um, in art collectors, how art collections have a new, deeper identity in relation to public communities. A, a, a sort of going back to rena Renaissance patronage, but with a twist, a contemporary twist. Uh, when I met with Caroline uh, Samling and Sharp last October, we thought why not to organize an art talk with different art collectors from all over the world and, um, and see and be inspired by the art projects. Their patronage not only gives back to community by supporting emergent artists and educational programs, but also leave an inspiring legacy for future generations to follow. So uh, tonight we are having uh, Georgina Adam, journalist, art market expert, author, and uh, what else, public speaker. Uh, and, and she will talk about the last uh, thought provoking book on museums and, uh, and the rise and rise of private art museums. We will have um, Beatrice Bulgari, art collector and, and the founder of uh, in between art film with curator Valentina Cerallo and uh, project manager Alessia Carlino. Uh, we, um, Caroline uh, Samblon Scharf, who will represent the cooperative storage model together uh, and we'll talk about her collection with the Stadt Gallery. Unfortunately, her curator is, is not here with us, so she will present us um, her wonderful collection. Uh, Nanne Decky, of course, CEO and founder of Artly, will talk about his, uh, his uh, art collections and, um, and more. Sylvain Levy, co-founder of DSL Collection, uh, and uh, will enlighten us on his latest art tech projects, uh, especially on the virtual museum space. And of course, Maria Sukar. Uh, art collector and patron of arts. Um, she's been with us many, many times on different podcasts. And she will talk about her e self collection, uh, which is at its core the existentialist collection, the identity of human beings, particularly in reference to the human condition. So, welcome to the Art Talks. And uh, we will start with Beatrice. Beatrice introduced by Valentina, art curator and art historian, Valentina Cerallo. Buonasera. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I introduce uh, just a little bit myself uh, because uh, many of you don't know me. Uh, so my name is Valentina Cerallo. I am a um, uh, historian of art and uh, curator. Uh, specialized in uh, contemporary languages, uh, 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 latest trends uh, in visual art at the YED uh, Rome University. Maybe yes, someone needs to mute their mic. I think Emil. Yes, I, I hope. Yes, this is please. If it's yeah. possible to mute everybody, their 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 microphone, please. And then at the end, we were having some, some questions we could, uh, at the end of the talk. Thank you. Can you hear me? Because the yes. line is a little bit uh, uh, not very clear, but uh, I think it's okay. So um, for uh, over 20 years, uh, I've been creating young and mid career artists with exhibition in a project linked to experiment experimentation inside institutional spaces, uh, museum and galleries, in a perpetual dialogue uh, between ancient and contemporary art, uh, which led me to create the cycle of initiative called Spirito, uh, conceived and realized between 2003 and, two, uh, and 2016 inside the Renaissance complex of Santo Spirito uh, in Sassia, Rome. Uh, the complex is the oldest uh, hospital in the city uh, that became uh, a venue for event uh, art uh, exhibition, especially for experimental and contemporary art. 
um, so we have dance uh, uh, network with Italian international artists and that promote, I, uh, promote and the, and support the research, always in dialogue with the uh, institutions. Um, I also uh, conceived and created our project related to the communication for important companies, Italian companies. Uh, so I use the contemporary uh, art uh, like a language for communicate, to communicate. Uh, so the project for Poste Italiane, BNLP, uh, the bank group, uh, uh, BNP Paribank, Bank, the Gruppo FS, the Italian Rollway, uh, all these projects win uh, prizes, uh, uh, like uh, best project, uh, project uh, of art in the uh, communication. Um, and I also work for the art project uh, for digital platform. Um, I believe that uh, contemporary art can be used uh, uh, more and more as means of communication, that more and more it must go behind the borders, uh, exploring the world, other worlds, uh, so like fashion, design, cinema, architecture. Uh, among the latest activities has been the creator of uh, a project called Carta Bianca, a new story, 49 artists for 49 covers uh, on the occasion on the white issue of Vogue Italia, mm -hmm. the magazine, uh, uh, the most important magazine of fashion Vogue Italia um, during April 2020. Uh, so uh, we were in the uh, first lockdown. So during the first lockdown, I called the 49 artists, Italian artists to restart uh, uh, from from the art uh, in the art uh, from a blank page. Uh, the project uh, disseminated globally with international uh, resonance. Uh, um, so uh, I I could explore that uh, if you uh, go more the edges uh, the 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 more the edges of the contemporary art of the art uh, the the art can explain much much better and uh, and also I, I am a creator of a special uh, project uh, for the first modern and contemporary art fair in uh, Rome that took place last uh, November. Um, I have known Beatrice Bulgari from uh, many years uh, because we are uh, Roman. Uh, we live uh, in Rome, so we 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 are uh, Italian, uh, and we make uh, projects in the city, but uh, not also in the city. Uh, and I choose uh, uh, Beatrice uh, as a collector be because she uh, represents uh, the ideal figures uh, of promoter of art. Uh, um, so uh, uh, also in addition, uh, in addition to being uh, uh, an important uh, history uh, of her family, like an um, excellent tradition of the made in, in Italy. Uh, but uh, um, we, we, we have an international, both of uh, us, we have uh, an international vision of art and we like to always to explore new realities in connection supporting contemporary art. Uh, Beatrice is not only a great collector, but promotes uh, artistic research. Uh, and she does so through the constant activity um, of our foundation uh, uh, called In Between Art Film, uh, which is uh, founded and preceded over since uh, 2019. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, Beatrice, uh, your activity uh, dates back <laughs> so uh, 10 years uh, uh, before, uh, because the, the name changed. And uh, its mission uh, is uh, to promote the culture of uh, the moving image and support international artists, uh, institutions, and research centers that explore the dialogue between uh, disciplines uh, such as a film, video, performance, uh, and installations. Um, 
the foundation uh, in between art film also support uh, events and in institutions like uh, the Biennale di Venezia, uh, Manifesta, um, Documenta, uh, so uh, all museums in the city of Rome. So it's uh, um, she's a great uh, supporter, uh, a promoter of the contemporary art. Um, just uh, on the occasion of the next biennial, we'll take, uh, we hope, uh, will be in April because I don't know if the biennial will uh, postpone. Um, uh, she will present uh, the last project uh, that she, she, she made. So uh, for me, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Beatrice. Uh, who tell us uh, all the news about uh, her work and the next uh, project. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina, for this <laughs> long presentation for me. <laughs> and uh, you, you say everything, so I don't know where I have to start. No, no, you have a, uh, you, I, you can see more and more. This, um, uh, foundation actually in 2020. And uh, the name of the foundation is In Between Art Film. This is, I choose this name precisely to um, uh, reflect what I think the interaction between uh, artistic languages and uh, like uh, cinema or performance. I worked in cinema for 20 years as a costume designer. So when I decided to move on and change as I am also a collector, I, I, I find, I try to find something that helps uh, these two uh, passion from my side, which is exactly cinema and uh, art. And of course in the, the digital world, in the world art, in the video, in the moving images, I find something that really is, uh, fits me. And we start with a company. The name of the company was In Between Art Film. And we start with the first movie, which was uh, exactly from uh, to video artists. We, for me, it's very interesting to follow the process with the artists, to follow the idea, to, to share uh, what they have in mind and to give them the possibility to uh, to do this, so this is uh, working on the commissioning and uh, production. And so we start in 2012 with this company and then we have many uh, film, uh, which was documentaries and also you know, video art films. Uh, we had with Shirin Shat, we had with uh, Pierre Bismuth uh, and uh, um, many other artists that were not exactly in the field of arts, but in this in between. Then when we decided to move to Fondazione, what this was a kind of a necessity for us to find a way to really help the artists that are, uh, especially in this time, because now it's two years with this pandemic situation. And mm -hmm. the change was already in that time that we moved from a company to to Fondazione. And the first project of the Fondazione was something that happened exactly in that time, in um, was March 2020, in the strictest moment, in the strictest uh, hard moment where everybody was in the lockdown and uh, we were, everybody was shocked that the artists were in the house. Uh, everybody was, you know, everything was canceled, uh, exhibition, travel uh, uh, project. Uh, we were, uh, the day after the lockdown, we were decided to go, we, we should go to Pantelleria, where we had a project that now will be presented in uh, the next, uh, uh, big uh, show in uh, the group show in uh, Venice. And uh, that moment I was struck by an article, uh, which is uh, the title was uh, Mascarilla 19. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by the article, but also by the title. So 
the, the article was regarding uh, Mascarilla 19, which is a campaign promoted by uh, Sanchez, uh, the prime minister of Spain. He um, decided to promote this, trying to go against this gender violence, especially during the lockdown. Um, the, the name Mascarilla 19 is a code that every woman can could use in any pharmacy in uh, Spain to ask for help because how can a woman help for ask for help when you are trapped at home maybe with your perpetrator? So they decided to make this code to help women to say, do you have a mascarilla 19? And suddenly the protocol uh, of the, the pharmacist goes. So this was for me is something how is possible that even even the prime minister has to think about how to help women and we that we are you know involved with art we don't know nothing I think that people that are involved in art like me are uh, me I am and um, we are connected with contemporary world. We are we able to do something when you have. So I felt the urgency to do by myself something. So I called the director of my foundation, Alessandro Rabottini, and the other two curators, uh, Paolo Golini and Leonardo Bigatti, and asked, have you ever heard about Mascarilla 19? And they say, no, what it is? And say, I think that we have to do something with this. And in that moment where our friends, artists are blocked at home. We decided to give them the possibility to think, to project something regarding this delicate uh, topic and give them uh, at least two months to think something. And it was very interesting to follow how them uh, related in different, um, of course, different approach, uh, different regard, different, uh, uh, emotion with this uh, um, delicate uh, gender violent team. And in the end, uh, after two months of, uh, you know, email, sending uh, um, email and everything and uh, ideas, um, finally, when we have this uh, uh, window to open, everything was the beginning of the summer, they were able to work. And then went to post production, and in October 2020, we were able to uh, present uh, uh, to the Maxi in Rome. This is to explain how how we work. I mean, in in general, everything it starts from a desire, desire to do something. Desire. I mean, it's not nothing is uh, in uh, in a way. Uh, pre-established is uh, something that works with what is going on in this moment. And that was very important for us that the first commission was a Mascarilla 19. And also I'm proud to say that a lot of them had a lot of uh, um, knowledge and awards. So it was for us uh, was really interesting. This was just to explain. Then I would like to say, as she says, uh, uh, Valentina, she talks about um, the connection with the, uh, and the partnership that we have with, with important um, institution. And this was uh, important for us also because uh, um, I think that we have, it's important, especially for a small foundation like we are, try to, uh, the, the important mission, the first project is to give to the artists the possibility to stay in connection con with the museum um, uh, institution. That's why we are related with uh, Biennial, with, we have with the Tate film, with the Documenta in Castle, we present the Janik and Ervant uh, and um, Angela Ricci Lucchi. Uh, we supported the, the film that they did there. And in, um, for example, Manifesta in Palermo, we supported the three artists and Masbedo, the duo, and uh, Yuri Ancarani and Jordi Colomer. They spent 
almost six, between six months and one year in Palermo to prepare the, their film in connection with the city. I mean, in, with Palermo, with the city, about cinema, about what, what they felt. So, and then we are, we are able to see that the films and the, all the project that they prepared are, you know, you can see in some uh, important museum. This is for us the most uh, important thing. Also, the foundation uh, has a lot of uh, initiatives. We have uh, this uh, new uh, research platform. The name is Still, it's a studies of moving images. We do this kind of uh, investigation um, through essays, writers, and curators. We have more than 30 uh, writers and curators and artists that are connected, um, everybody uh, to try to explain their work and to give a kind of, um, uh, in the website to explore exactly the works of the foundation, the collection. And um, in the end of uh, each year, we are able to uh, have uh, a book published by Moss, which is uh, for us, you know, one year complete of this uh, important essay, which is, I think is important to have uh, to, to keep in uh, something, not only digital, but also. And uh, as you said, a fundamental part of our program is commissioning, commissioning uh, for the artist. And after Mascarilla 19, uh, I'm sorry, I, we are not able to, to share this uh, part of the videos that we prepared regarding Mascarilla. But it's interesting because every um, artist uh, has an, is a special uh, approach. For example, we, we, the most interesting part for me was the two months that we were working uh, by, by video, of course, by Zoom, and um, was a way also to, um, over this, this difficult moment. And for example, we have an artist, he was uh, in Amsterdam, and, but he's from Lahore, and uh, the name is Basil Mahmoud, that then he won the Amodo Tiger Award in Rotterdam. And he was so, uh, so confused in the beginning, because he said, I don't know if I am able to, um in a way contact this uh, delicate issue and uh, i i need time so i started to send some beautiful uh, drawings and uh, um, some uh, thinking and and then from this we start a relation and he say i decided to, to direct uh, my cameraman and everybody from my place so he took uh, uh, the cameraman and the family of the cameraman. Because that moment in the COVID, you can go say 16 person only if you are related. So it was an interesting project even for him too. And he was on the telephone and by, and always directioning them. And the idea was to repeat and repeat and repeat in a theater, a scene of a violence that you never see, but you can catch in a way. Or another one, for example, for was uh, Adrian Paci. Adrian Paci was uh, the, is a video artist. He was uh, also very uh, difficult. In the beginning, it was uh, even uh, uh, ironic regarding the thing. He say, "How do you think I can do something from my house? I am here with my digital phone, and I can do something with my my telephone, with my mobile." My boy, but I say you start, you think, and and then one day finally send an email. He saying, "Listen, I thought I have an idea. It's a fantastic idea. I have. I want just uh, the screen 
completely red as my finger when I put on the camera of the telephone, everything red. And I have this uh, uh, terrible dialogue which a victim of violence that talk about what happened and why it's like, uh, um, like she was in a, in a analytic uh, session. And they say, we we have some pictures here. Uh, can we can we share some pictures? This is, yes, I think the, that the picture the is a regarding the, the upcoming the project. Yeah. And yes. I, yes, this upcoming project. The yes. name is uh, the name is um, Penumbra. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah. With this uh, project, uh, um, uh, we are going to represent uh, in uh, Fondazione in Between Art Film, like a very first exhibition opening to the public. And um, this one that we are seeing, this one is uh, the, I know, this is Aziz Azara. And this work is uh, in a way material and metaphorical exploration of darkness in light. Uh, this is the city of Kabul. It's, it's, it's uh, filmed the right after the invasion of the Taliban, and the work becomes like uh, a symphony of sound, uh, terror, and shadow. It's, uh, it's really, it's, it's like uh, 15 minutes, and uh, we are in the beginning. They are still working on this. He is still on post production to be ready for. April 20, when uh, we have this uh, exhibition. And uh, then we have, um, uh, this is Anna Vaz. Anna Vaz is um, a Brazilian. She works on this, in this zoo, zoo in, um, in the city of um, Brasilia. And this, uh, where is, uh, uh, this is a very, um, I can say it's immersive, this kind of film, and especially because we are proposing this film in a big uh, room in, uh, in this place in Venezia, in uh, Spedaletto. It's that will, uh, this is a, a big, it's a church, uh, Santa Maria dei Derelitti, and it's also um, um, this part of Spedaletto that uh, now is, of course, changed a lot of different uh, period. And the, the project is uh, organized by uh, our art, our um, Ippolito Pastellini, uh, which is also I say, all this uh, kind of organization of the architectural space. Um, so this was Anna Vaz. Then this, this is Karima Ashdu. It is uh, she is um, from Nigeria, and um, but she is based in UK, and she uh, brings into focus in in this uh, beauty of these workers that uh, work in uh, in a mine. Minus, né? and uh, she tried to explain uh, the the daily routine, uh, which has also the the beauty the, of in this uh, desperation uh, of uh, the work. It's also how is uh, um, for them is uh, um, easy to connect with the the ground with the, the this situation also because we. We are trying in the, with this, uh, with this uh, um, show, we are trying to put together also a lot different artists that works in different geopolitical situation. This is Emilia Scarnolite that um, uh, works in this idea also of um, light and uh, uh, darkness because all the project of Penumbra is with this idea to stay, uh, because the city of Venice also has this kind of light and obscurity. So um, this project especially is on the uh, possibility of silence 
lights and um, sound and uh, connection with the reality. This is uh, uh, Jonathan de Andreade, um, he's Brazilian. We are very proud also because Jonathan de Andreade is uh, uh, now will be uh, representing Brazil in uh, during his uh, in the, at the Biennale, so we, we didn't know this. So we are very happy that we have together in the same moment uh, his uh, film. This film is uh, uh, it's the name is the expression "Boca Libre," means kind of a party with a free meal. So with uh, workers, people, uh, villages, and uh, of course he is. Uh, um, trying to uh, talk also with the marginalized communities. So it's interesting how he worked in this. And, uh, and this is um, uh, the film that uh, I told you we were trying to prepare two years ago in Pantelleria, and now they are still working. Uh, now is the last week for uh, uh, to be ready. Pantelleria is uh, a film regarding uh, a, an episode very important that happened in uh, south of Italy uh, during the Second World War. And it's something which is between uh, uh, fake news and uh, reality and how the island um, uh, reflected and how uh, deal with this uh, uh, kind of a bombing, which is real from one side and unreal from the other side. But you will see the film at uh, uh, in April. I don't know if thank I went too much. Maybe thank I you, didn't. thank you, no, Beatrice. It's a very, very interesting this dialogue between video, uh, cinema, and performance, and we can't wait to see. Hopefully, very soon in the, in the Biennale. Grazie. I'm, I'm jumping. Uh, to Sylvain because he is uh, going to leave very soon. Sylvain, so you are uh, uh, your, you are the co-founder of uh, the DSL uh, collection with Dominique Levy, uh, an art collection that embraces the discovery, study, and promotes Chinese contemporary artistic and cultural uh, production by different works of art. And you said you embody a little bit as everybody else, the 21st century collector that must think beyond boundaries. Could you tell us a bit more? Uh, Carolina, thank you very much for inviting me. And I think uh, all the voices that we're going to hear tonight are very inspiring. I think it will show that art and especially collecting is, uh, is a personal journey. And every personal journey has to be respected and has to be encouraged. So uh, what I want to say today is just to share our personal journey. And we don't have the truth. We have our, our own truth. Uh, but I think uh, uh, it's interesting also to, to bring the, our truth because we have taken a kind of singular path in terms of collecting. Mm -hmm. I will focus more on the projects than on the artworks. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone wants to see the artwork, uh, just go to the website, the SL book, and you will have the presentation of the artworks. So let's navigate from the past to the present and to the future. Uh, past is very simple. We've been collecting with my wife for 37 years. Uh, and it's a long journey, but it's a great journey. And we've seen a lot of things uh, changing in the art world from uh, this beginning to today. And we will see, I hope, a lot of things uh, in the future also changing. Uh, we've collected uh, contemporary art. We've collected work perhaps among the first to collect design. And we have a very, very strong design collection. Uh, you know, when nobody knew uh, Mark Newson, Ron Arad, and all these guys, we already been collecting these people. Uh, and, and then in 2005, we went to China uh, because my brother-in-law was moving to China. And uh, after uh, visiting uh, Carrefour and Ikea, 
uh, I said to my wife, I would like to see an art studio or in a gallery. And we went to Morgenstern and we met Lawrence Eppley from Shanghai. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, we had a shock with uh, Lawrence, with the first artist we met, Bingy. But also we had a shock being in China, when you come from a kind of sleeping beauty like Paris to a kind of Red Bull city like Shanghai, you have a shock. And we think that art is one of the mirror of a society. And we wanted to find in Chinese contemporary art this, I should say, this energy that we can experience in the, in the city. So we went back to Paris and uh, the challenge, okay, we said we will focus on Chinese contemporary art, but how to focus on Chinese contemporary art when you live 12,000 kilometers from China, you don't speak the language. And at this time, there was no many galleries, no many institutional validation. And we had the chance to meet Chinese artists in Paris. And they said, okay, we are re ready to help you, but what type of collection you want to do? Is it to decorate your home? Is it for investment? What, what you want to do? And we said, okay, let's go for a type of museum collection. It meant that we were ready to collect all types of work, installation, videos, sculptures, painting. But what was very interesting at this time, it meant also that we want to be public. So for the first time in our life, we decided to become a public collection. 2005, it was uh, the beginning of YouTube. It brings me to something very interesting, is the notion of contemporary. What is to be contemporary? I think that everybody can have his own notion. But for me, to be contemporary is to challenge the statu quo. It's nothing linked with the age. It's nothing linked with the date. You can be old and challenge the statu quo. Greco is still contemporary for me. And you have a lot of young artists who are not contemporary for me. So this is something very important is we want to be challenging the statu quo. Challenge the statu quo means also when you collect, you challenge yourself by the way you collect. And also by the way you share your collection. This is, I shall say, to apply contemporary spirit also to a collection, which is not only about object, but also about an attitude, and also about how you will, I shall say, share your attitude with the others. So 2005, coming back to 2005, it was the beginning of YouTube. And so we said, why we should not try to embrace this new digital wave to share the collection, especially with the Chinese people, but also with the Western people. And so we decided to become a kind of nomad collection, but a digital collection, because all the works of the collection can be shown and can be alone, and not just only. Museum. Yes. If you look at the definition of the museum, in the icon definition, uh, the definition of the uh, of the icon, there is no any word related to a space. It's about an institution with missions. So this is very important. Also, if space is important, and we have to respect people who open space. I really respect their generosity, but it's not our story. But we, once again, I really have a lot of respect for people opening for museums or spaces, especially in countries where the government is not helping contemporary art. Coming back to the SL, so from 2005, we begin to surf on the digital wave. 2011 really were the first one to open an app on the iPad. iPad was just launched in 2010, and in 2011, just a few months after, we had an iPad. And just to tell you a small story, because I always love that story, I was you know, with my iPad going into fairs, and someone came to me and said, Sylvain, are you broke it? Because you cannot offer you a printed catalog. I said, no. Uh, I'm not broke, but I think that an iPad is quite useful. So we went from that and we went to uh, Second Life. And uh, in 2015, we began to explore virtual reality. 
What is very interesting is what happened with the COVID. I think the COVID for me is uh, the revelator of, I shall say, the end of an old world and the nation of a new world. The COVID for me is the birth of a new human being in a certain way. Because now what the COVID showed is that everybody has a digital twin. And this digital twin spends between X hours on the digital world. And this digital twin has its own emotion, desire, way to connect, way to consume. And this is for me what happened with the COVID. And everybody went online with the COVID. And to tell you the truth, most of the experiences were not very satisfactory because you don't replicate the offline online. When you go online, you create a new experience. That brought us to look at the video games because who mastered the, world, the best screen? It's the people from the video game. A part of mastering the, the, the screen and creating something which I should say is connecting 1 billion and 500 billion people, it's also the only business model which is working today is the video screen. And the, today, the turnover of video games, sorry, video games, the turnover of the video games is bigger than the turnover of the cinema and the music industry. So we went into video game and we learned, I should say, the notion of gaming. And we learned a lot. We learned a lot. Because what we learned also by looking at museums, that we are moving from contemplation to experience, and especially with the immersive experience like Team Lab or Kusama. So the idea of immersion and gaming becomes something very important for us. And so in 2010, we launched our first video game, The Forgetter. And uh, we launched it with uh, two persons, Alan Kwan and Anison Young. Uh, they, are, uh, 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 they are based in Hong Kong. And to tell you the truth, uh, we're very happy with this project. This project has been nominated by Tencent as the best serious game of the year. And we had also two other or three other more nominations. And we learned a lot on how to bring new types of community into art with the video game. Now we are working with a new team, a front Romanian team, and we will deliver a new video game uh, by the end of June. What also we noticed at this time, it was the, I should say, the beginning of, I should say, the, the discovery of the virtual reality. And especially the last months, everybody has heard about metaverse. And in 2010, we decided to create our own metaverse. What is metaverse? Metaverse, uh, to make it very simple, Today, you go to internet. Tomorrow, you, you will live in internet with your avatar. And today, you have platforms like Fortnite, where you have 350 million people on this platform. And when Ariane Grande make a concert, she has, I think, 10 million people uh, were, were lo looking at the concert. And so today, you have this new world called the metaverse. And it was very interesting to see that Microsoft has bought for $70 billion a video game called Artvision. Because with this company, Microsoft will enter into the metaverse. And also, naturally, Facebook became meta. But today, it's a concept. It's a concept. It's a concept that slowly and slowly, this concept will become reality and this concept will become reality. And more and more, we will be part of this new world. But it can take two years, it can take five years. What we have done with this metaverse project for DSL, we created especially two spaces. One 
created with the Shenzhen Museum, the Shenzhen Museum, the Pink Shen Museum, where you enter into a museum and you can experience uh, works of the GSL collection. And the other one, we've done it with the NYU and especially t Shard School, who have recreated the Washington Square Garden. And you can walk inside with friends, with your avatar, who have already their exhibitions. And uh, you walk inside, you can walk without headset or, or with a headset. And if you are with a headset, you really feel that you are there. It has been done, uh, you know, in this famous square in New York, under the snow, we decided to make this experience under the snow. And we are expanding this metaverse to other spaces, and not only to art spaces, but it will be also to music spaces or to fashion spaces. So this is our program for this next year, also to go into the metaverse. What was interesting also is that we thought it was also interesting to bring the public institutions to understand art and technology and to better understand, I shall say, because more and more art and technology will collide. And so we decided to create what I shall call DSL hub spaces. We create a DSL hub space in Shenzhen, one in the National Institute of Modern Art in Kiev. We just opened one in Bogota a few days ago, in the National Museum of Bogota. And we are opening one in an independent space, a small one, a pocket space, 70 square meter only in Hong Kong. In all these spaces, we found total, uh, I shall say, total uh, uh, installations with headsets and computers. And these rooms are dedicated to all new types of technology. It means technology linked with virtual reality, but also technology with digital content. Why it's very important for us to do something like this? First, it brings a new, types, a new type of audience into the museums, and especially the young one. But also, it means it, it's very interesting to see with all the experiences that we have done, that it changes the mindset inside the museum. More and more people understand from the inside what can technology bring to them. But also what is very important for us with this project, we want to put the finger off what is for me the crucial question today in the art world is about the financial sustainability. Today, there is no museum in the world which, is, which can cover its overhead. No museum in the world. A lot of collections are suffering because also they have these financial issues. And I can say even for us, we are limited by our financial issues. And if you look at the other cultural goods, cinema, music, film, books, newspaper, all these industry have transformed themselves by having a digital monetized content. So the art world, if they want it or if they don't want it, they will have to go to something like this. And so what is very important today for the next decade is really to always make technology serve art, but also always make art speaks the language of its time. And I think that the biggest problem that we have today in the art world, and uh, I would like really to, uh, to, 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 I should say to illustrate my, my state of mind with a, a very interesting quote of, uh, you know, uh, Romazzi Lomporezo is that uh, if you want things to stay the same, you have to change everything. Mm -hmm. And if we want the museum to survive, it has to change. And we need museum. I think museum are places for the well-being of the people. I think museum are the places for our culture and heritage. We need museum, but we need museum which are also able to adapt to our present time. So this is a little bit the challenges that we face in this new decade, which is a decade, I shall say, uh, full of uncertainties, a kind of decade of uh, the, the terra incognita in the Middle Age. 
where we can find gold, but we will find also black swans. To, to, to I should say, to, to, to summarize my state of mind, uh, our state of mind of Dominique and myself, I can say that for me, collecting can make ordinary person have an extraordinary life. And I think that what we've been experiencing, the whole, I should say, journey as a collector from being, you know, uh, the Saturday in galleries, uh, which were the model a little bit like the Leo Castelli model, to today being in the metaverse, and also to have the chances, the chance to have been in China, I shall say, in the golden time in terms of collecting, I think is make us very, very fortunate. And to finish, what makes us also very fortunate is that our daughter now is in charge of all the projects. And so now I can take care of my grandson. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's it. That's uh, how I can summarize in a, a few minutes uh, 37 years of, uh, of collecting. Thank you, Sylvain. It, it, was, it is wonderful. I think, you know, what is, uh, is uh, uh, I think it's fascinating what you have been done until now and the, your vision, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible because as you said, everything changed in a couple of uh, months and uh, we are not even, not anymore blockchain, now, after Nanne will we'll talk, uh, but we are NFTs and now it's metaverse, which is again, fascinating and we could talk for forever. But, uh, Amina, I just want to ask to Silvan, if uh, um, uh, has worked with the Greek artist Miltos Manetas about the metaverse uh, to Silvan Levy? Yeah. Like to, uh, yes, do, do you know him? No, I don't know him, but I will be very happy to know him. Yeah, so, ah, it's, uh, it's, I, um, uh, I will introduce him because uh, he, has, he has been working 10 years ago about metaverse. Yes, so true. You know, very special. So uh, he made a, just uh, an exhibition in Paris uh, just a few, uh, few months ago. So maybe we keep in touch because uh, it's very... With special. pleasure. Okay. You, know, you know, first, you know what you say? It's very interesting because the metaverse is not something new. It has been yeah, existing you know, for 30 no. years. He knows, so, he knows that it's not new. It's no, so, so it, it's very interesting what you say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Carolina, just to, 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 you know, to, to give a, a word to what you said, you know, uh, we have to be very humble. And what I've learned from life, the most difficult is to last. And if you invited me, if you invite me in 10 years, it means that uh, we have succeeded to last. So uh, let us make the challenge and the, and the bet that uh, we have to, uh, to stay relevant uh, for the next 10 years. And this is, I can tell you, this is very challenging today. Very, yeah. very challenging true. to be very agile, very agile, uh, very, uh, I shall say, very creative in, in connecting the dots in a very different way. And also to be very open, very, very open. And, uh, and also really what is important is to preserve art. I think we have entered into a world which looks like 1984. Uh, in many, many ways. And the only way to survive will be uh, human, humanization. And yes. I think art is the best way, one of the best way to, I shall say, to keep us a human being and not to become cyber bog. Yes, uh, I, I agree, Sylvain. I agree totally that we have to be human in the metaverse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, your, your uh, attention. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Sylvain. Thank you again for, for being with us. And now we are jumping in another collection that is all about pressing issues of our time by Caroline Sharp, Samling Sharp. Hello, Caroline, finally. <laughs> how are you? How are you? I, I would love to talk about your, your, the intangible sensation of the present. This is beautiful. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Caroline and I'm a collector from Germany in the second generation. My parents built up a collection in the 80s till 2000 with the major focus on paintings in, the, in Germany, England, and in the States. 
And my collection starts from 2000 till today. I'm also focused on paintings as well as sculptures on critical matters. In 2004, my parents became older and they asked me to take care of their of the family collection. And I put at first, you know, I looked in the archives, I built it up and I looked at all the figures and now I want to I hope that I can show you my slide. Can you see it? We can. can you see my desktop? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Thank you, Karen. So we are a small collection, and if I talk about the collection, it's always the family collection and my own collection. We have 400 works, which are 300 paintings, and uh, 100 works in museums quality and size. I know this because doing the archive, I realized and I can see which works are often out for loans and which works are non out for not often out for loans. And at the time I took over the directorship, we had 50 works on loan in museums, but uh, none were on display. They were all stored away. And then I thought that's not the way to work together anymore. So what can we do? It's like, can we build a private museum? How many works would I require to have like a showroom, a public showroom? How many costs, how much money do I need? And what is our collection history? Does it fit to us to be authentical? And our collection history starts with this work by Duane Hansen in 1972. Uh, this cleaning woman, she was always sitting in front of our apartment and she was always making a lot of trouble because like people, you know, thought that she would be sick because she didn't greet back and they would call the police or the firemen or the doctors. So one day my parents decided to put the work as a loan in the museum. And after 10 years being in the museums, the, the director came to us and they said, you know, it's an iconic piece of our museum and we want to buy it. And now it belongs to the museum and it's there since ever. So it's my childhood I visit if I visit the museum. So I then I said like, uh, so I, what I want to do is I want to reinforce and to stay with our collection history. I don't want to have a private museum because we don't have enough works. If you even say you work with 200 works and then I'm not talking about our 101A works, but I you know, include 100 more, it's still not really enough. I think like, you know, normally you should probably have 1000 till 2000 depending on the size of the space. And the running costs would, would over exceed our means. But also we have in Germany, really great public museums, which all have problems. You know, they have collection holes, they have small acquisition budgets, they have exploring storage costs, and they have exploring insurance costs, exploding insurance costs. So I said, why not putting this together and we call this, or the name is a curative storage model. And it, uh, it has three parts, it's museums, it's a foundation, and it's uh, the two collections. And why? Well, I, at first I described the features. So th these are the museums I cooperate with. And you see it's in the south of Germany, it's a little bit crowded. That's because uh, we grew up there and we lived there for a long time. These are the details. It's at first we have with the museum a co cooperation contract and uh, I selected them strategically. So like for example, the museum in Bonn, uh, their focus is on German painting after 45, but they have only one Albert Oehlen, they have no Neo Rauch, they have no Andre Butzer. And these are all positions. Uh, we are very strong in our collection. So we can perfectly work together. Uh, it's so the the storage. It's like so. I have all works with me. I have I store them on my own cost. I take care of my own loan, you know, loan traffic, uh, and I do the the own restoration. They have no costs that comes with it. That is annexed with it. 
But if they loan something and they put it on the wall, then of course, at the time it's in the museum wall, they have to pay the, the insurance. But all the other cost lays with us. And as soon if they put it down the wall, then I take it over again. And now they are really, uh, you know, they like it a lot because it saves them for, for example, they have no budget for storage costs. So it saves them a lot of budgets as well. Also, I am not influencing the hanging. So it's all up to them. I only have a pool I can offer them and whatever they take out and whatever they do with it, it's fine with me. And to have some examples, this is in the art museum in Bonn, now the wool room from our collection. And this is like a dialogue show I just have right now with the, the County Museum, the Staatsgalerie Stuttgart. It's always, it's with my collection. It's always one work from their collection, that's Katharina Sieverding, and one work from my collection in dialogue, that's Kapwani Kivanga, and it's the theme is, is about racism. Or as another example here, it's Anna Uttenberg and Jürgen Klauke and Simon Lee in dialogue about identity. Um, that's how I work together with the museum. I normally the curator of the show would have been here to give a short talk, but she is sick. So I have for my archive, I have a video about the director of the museum and, and about the our model system, but I look at the watch and I don't know, Carolina, it's about four minutes whether we should do it or whether you like to move on. I am okay. Uh, I will ask only the other panelists be, uh, if you are okay to be with us for four minutes more. Nande? Yes, perfect. Yes, Caroline. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Give me a minute. Oh, now I don't know how do I get back. Don't worry, <laughs> we have all the time of the world. All the eyes are on you, Caroline. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm panicking. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, now I think it's getting okay. better. <laughs> okay. Yes. Do you see it? No, no, not yet. Not yet, and now? The system, the Trump family is yeah, now. We can hear it. Okay, but we have no. Hmm. Why? Wait, let's see. Okay, last try now. Did you see it now? Wonderful. Yes. yes. That's yes. A, a Christiane Lange, the director of the County Museum. Shops to have their collection in their storage, they, uh, they take uh, care of it. And in the moment, the museum needs support for an exhibition, for the permanent collection, or for a uh, <clears throat> temporary exhibition. We can uh, get these works of art as a part of our collection. We can, we can use it as if it would be part of our collection. And this is a wonderful situation we do not have with any other collector in the moment. And I hope that the system will uh, be a role model for other collectors in the future. What are the key factors for a successful cooperation between museums and private collectors? Uh, the most important, uh, Factor for a successful cooperation in my eyes is that uh, the collectors and the museums um, estimate uh, each other on the same level. That it's not like we have so much money and we can buy everything, uh, and the museum is just the, the, the little beggar, and uh, we we have to to do everything the collectors want, and vice versa. The the museum is not the place where the collector has to to beg that he is allowed to to exhibit one of his works. I think it's really important to to find the level of uh, estimation of the uh, qualities 
of the private collecting and public collecting. These are two different uh, things. The private collector always has a very personal attitude uh, and a personal relation to artists. And uh, as it was in the, in the past, in the last centuries as well, the private collection is always different to a public collection. And uh, to strengthen both uh, ways of collecting, it's important to have good exchange and uh, yeah, and, and the estimation of the of the value of both uh, forms of collecting. And do you think it's the last question that this is a role model that will carry on for the future too? Um, the the role model of your family of the Sharp family should be become a role model because it's really um, a wonderful uh, gesture. It's it's really the the, the first. Um, the first collector that I, I know who is not um, giving the whole collection as gift, um, which is always like you, you can get the whole gift or Nothing. take it or leave it. Yeah. Yeah. And to get the whole collection is from time to time, from collection to collection different, but it's 1%, 10%, or in the best, maybe 50%, but never ever 100% of the collection is museum level works of art. So you, you get the whole collection, it means you, you have to invest lots of money, even when you don't have to buy it, you have to take care for these works of art forever. And this costs lots of money for, for the public and for the future. And, um, and what your um, role model is now is that you keep your collection, you take care of this collection, and you um, you don't uh, think everything is museum quality. You you really give us uh, give it uh, as an offer, an offer that the museum um, the, that the museum's curators are allowed to take the benefits and uh, but they don't have to to uh, invest for the whole collection so th that's why we have this the third part that's that's the foundation so we give from time to time we give gifts to the museum so that something from our collection will always stay there so that's how we work together with public museums. It's a little bit more tra traditional than the the other yes. people <laughs> before me. Yes. yes, indeed. But again, it's a, it's a beautiful, uh, Caroline, to see this continuation between past, present, and future on the identity of uh, of the artist and on the themes of everyday life, which I have to say they are quite important, especially now to to solve. <laughs> Yes, if we can, true. if we can, through <laughs> art. But thank you, Karen. It was beautiful. You're welcome. Thank you again for inspiring this art talk today. So now I would like to uh, introduce Nanne, Nanne Decking. Hello, Nanne. How are you? Hi, Carolina. Thank you. And uh, Nanne yeah. is the CEO and the founder of Artery, is been in the art world for a very long time. But I would like you to, to, to introduce you with the one sentence, actually, one quote that uh, Sylvain also used. And I remember you <laughs> used a long time ago, and I love it. It's from Giuseppe Tomasi. If we want things to stay as they are, we have to, we'll, we, things have, will have to change. Right. Thank you, Caroline, for that introduction. Yes, I saw that Sylvain stole my quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, rest Thank assured, you. we're not going to talk about blockchain technology here, and I also want to keep it really short because there are so many inspiring people. Caroline, for me, it's the first time that I heard you talk and to hear about your family collection and the way you give back to the world, basically, by adding masterpieces from that incredible collection. Very inspiring. And Georgina, I had to think about our mutual friend, Hal Nefkins. It's very much the way that he collects as well. He even builds a collection already knowing the museum that he wants to, uh, to, to give it on loan to. Um, it's a bit of a short story. I'm, I'm not a big collector myself, but I wanted to really focus on collecting. And I was in a very fortunate position uh, in my years as an art dealer and 
honestly spoken, also an art expert. I started with expertise and then I became a dealer, is to have been able to help people in collecting uh, very much on the practical side, if it was about provenance issues, but of course also on the art side. Although I have to say with passionate collectors, you don't really help. These, co these collectors usually know exactly what they want. Uh, it's sort of an addiction and they follow their heart and they follow their passion. And all you can do is accommodate and help them to steer them to an inventory you happen to know or a repository that you happen to know. But we're all collectors, right? Um, if you think about, let me, can you see this? Yes. Good. If you think about when you're a child, I grew up very close to, to the sea and you collect shells when you're three years old and you display them in your room. I've checked with people from Ukraine who don't live close to the sea and they collect stones and precious stones and they collect them and they, they put them in a beautiful display in the room. That, that's how you become a collector. A collection is all about your identity, I would say. If you look, I remember as a student, when, when you start collecting, you start to collect books. Because I was a poor student, so you have your books and you buy your IKEA Billy display case and your hands hurt for three days with all the screwing that you have to do. And you display your first books and it says something about your identity or how you want other people to perceive yourself. My husband and I learned a lot about identity because we're raising two African-American children. And in a country as America, and honestly spoken, many European countries are exactly the same, although you always blame America for it. In a racially completely diverse country like the United States, you, you realize what a challenge it is to, to raise two children of color in a completely white environment. So you first start to look, how can I change my environment? How can I diversify my, my, my racial uh, uh, structure of my, of my group of friends. And we also decided when we started to collect art, to collect art of African-American artists. And it says something about the way we want that ourselves to be identified and also how we try to, 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 to create an environment for our children that they would hopefully uh, feel safe in uh, and could identify with. So for me, the identity, your identity is very much reflected in the art collection, in, in your art collection, especially because it also takes a lot of space. A book in the end is also just a cover. You really have to look if you want to see what kind of title someone collects in, in his or her library. And art is, of course, occupying your walls, which is quite a statement that you make. It's also the reason why I believe that people are so incredibly angry and disappointed when they've bought a forgery because it says something about what happened to you. You firmly believed in, in that artwork and you identified with it. And you also believed that it showed in a way your own identity and that all of a sudden is breached. So I, many collectors, uh, it's a privilege of to, to help building up some collections and everybody knows that uh, when, when the, the person called Hasso Plattner, a German collector, when he started collecting, um, I played a very much, uh, very important role in, in, the, in, in building up, in the buildup of that collection, especially in the early years. Uh, we're talking about someone who was not a collector yet, but knew that he wanted to collect French Impressionist and especially French Impressionist uh, landscape paintings. Laser sharp focus, very intelligent and obsessed, obsessed with Monet in the beginning. And as Caroline knows, uh, in Germany, he actually did make his collection public at a certain moment. And this is one of the pieces that we sold him in the start of when he, when he started to collect his Nymphia, you see on the right. Um, but uh, he, he started to share his passion with the world in a very big way. And for that, he even built a museum. And the museum as such is already quite a miracle because it's the reconstruction of a building that was uh, destroyed in the Second World War. And he reconstructed that museum, which in itself, and it still exists, was already a copy of a palazzo in Rome, the Palazzo Barberini. So it's the second incarnation of that building. And in that museum, there is now the collection of French uh, Impressionist landscapes, but much more. Because if you talk about identity for this person who was born in Berlin, who knew what happened in Berlin in the Second World War, who lived when 
Berlin was, was still divided by the Berlin Wall. When I became vice chairman at Sotheby's, one of the pieces he bought was this Martin Kippenberger. Um, it's most, most of you will know the work. It's actually not even made by Kippenberger. It was made by a very famous cartoon uh, uh, maker in, in those days, but it was commissioned by Kippenberger. So it's one of the works where the authentic, authenticity starts to play a role because it's definitely authentic. It's definitely a creation of Kippenberg, although not by his own hand. And of course, the political impact of, of the work is immense if you realize that you were actually raised in, in a divided Germany, in a divided uh, Europe. And this huge piece, it's very big dimension, is now part of the collection of the Museum Barberini. And in the 80s, it was in a very famous bar in, in Germany. So he also brought it back to Germany. So what I'm trying to say is you cannot be a collector without your own identity shining through. I'm not a psychologist, so I don't want to judge for someone like Hasso Plattner why he was collecting French Impressionist painter. I have some ideas, but he should say that himself to the world. But with a work like this, you realize what actually happens when you are a collector. So to keep it very short, this is the Kehinda Wiley that we bought. We have, uh, as I said, only art of African-American artists. One of our real stars is also Demetrius Oliver. Uh, this Kehinda Wiley we bought quite a long time ago. Um, and I hope that it will help make our children feel a little bit more at home, so to say. And just one word about uh, the company that we started, what we, what we did is we started using NFTs already when nobody even knew what an NFT was, but there are, our NFTs we call due diligence NFTs and they capture information that refers to the due diligence done on the artwork. And for that, we always work with third parties, in this case, the Winston Art Group, who actually did due diligence on the artwork and that's all captured in an NFT. And that brings us to technology and Sylvain, who was so eloquent talking about the metaverse, uh, there's a lot happening in, in the art space. There's a lot happening if you talk about virtual space. If you look at your own kids, you realize they're always online. They're only look, always looking at images. And I want to end with saying when I brought my son to the Museum of Modern Art, because I want him to be passionate about the Nymphia, and you saw one of the Nymphias of Monet already, but here in New York, we have that very big Nymphia at the Museum of Modern Art. I only could get him interested in the piece when I pulled out my phone and I showed them the actual garden in Giverny. Uh, so again, digital images helped understanding physical images. So art without thinking about your own identity, art without passion doesn't exist. And uh, I'm humbled that I'm in the surrounding of people who collect at a much larger scale than I could ever do. And uh, Carolina, as always, thank you for giving the opportunity to talk a little bit. Thank you, Namne. It was indeed, uh, as I said, very, very important what you said, because uh, we all have children and they are, yes, that's the only thing our, these, these are our, the future generation, and the only way it's uh, to combine this, this incredible means that we have uh, now with, with art, but also to, to see all the, you were one of the first guru of, uh, of everything that started at the beginning of the beginning. So thank you, Nanne, for all your- Not all of everything, but a little bit in blockchain and art, yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit, <laughs> yes, okay. So now, uh, thank you, Nanne, and um, I'm going to Maria Sukar. Hello, Maria. Uh, Maria, Hi. as I said, is uh, not only an art collector, but patron of arts. She's been part of the International Council at Tate and sits at the Middle Eastern Acquisition Committee and their Photography Acquisition Committee, but also on the boards with many, many museums and very, very active uh, with their wonderful collection itself, which has uh, uh, the importance of structure and depth uh, at, with its core, as I said, in existentialism at its core. Maria. Um, hello, everyone. Carolina, thank you so much for inviting me to be on this uh, Zoom call. It's very inspiring. And uh, I honestly feel so honored and humbled. Uh, I'm quite a junior collector, 
And um, I'm, I've learned a lot today from listening to everybody talking and sharing their experiences. Uh, and it's very inspiring because um, as Sylvain said, the difficulty is to survive in the future. So mm -hmm. uh, it gave me a lot of ideas on what to do next. But before talking about what to do next, uh, allow me to introduce myself and introduce my collection and who I am. So um, my name is Maria Sukkar. I'm Lebanese and I've been living in London for the past 18 years. Uh, I collect art with my husband Malik. Our collection is called I Self. Uh, I will circle back quickly to what Nane said about collectors and identity. Uh, it is true that uh, what you collect defines you. I collect seashells. I collect galley stones whenever I go to a beach or a holiday destination. I really collect stones like kids and I put them in small bags and I label them and now they are all uh, sit on my desk. I also collect uh, postcards. You know, when you go to museums and you see an exhibition and then you leave the show and there's always a shop. I always head to the postcard section and I buy at least 25 postcards. I don't use them. I don't share them with friends. I have them in a special cupboard because they are a precious reminder of that exhibition and of the feelings that it had elicited in me at that point in time. Uh, now back to what I do and what is iSelf. Uh, iSelf is an art collection. It's a contemporary art collection with a few modern art pieces. Uh, it has uh, all types of media from painting to sculpture to moving image to photography. Um, how, why is it called I Self? It's called I Self because I Self is made up of two words, the I and the self. And it is a word that I came up with. I coined these two together. And um, my husband, who is very critical usually, liked the term and we went ahead with it. We started collecting uh, around in 2006, 2007. It was very messy and chaotic at the beginning. Uh, we were very excited going to art galleries in London and abroad and art fairs and buying and having fun. And then when we realized that uh, it had taken a life of its own, you know, collecting is like a snowball effect it was growing and we thought that we needed guidance and help. We enlisted the advice of an amazing uh, art advisor, but also curator that has become a dear friend of mine. Her name is Prue O'Day and she helped us focus our efforts. Um, we sat down one day and looked at what we collected before giving the collection a name and before looking at any theme and as Sylvain said, we were trying to connect the dots. And we realized that a lot of the pieces that we bought uh, looked at the human condition. So what is the human condition? The human condition is all the themes that shape our day-to-day -day life. There was a lot of art that spoke about love or death or sex or motherhood. Mm -hmm. And we tried to combine all these themes and I am very influenced by philosophy. I was educated at a French school and it all um, fell down to one theme that I call existentialism. And then I thought existentialism is about the I, it's about the self, it's about le moi, the human being. And I thought, let's call it I self. And this is how the collection was known to be I self. Uh, it has, um, I will not say how many artworks, but all I can say is that uh, we live with as much as we can of the pieces. It's very difficult to fit everything in one place. Um, we had a home in Lebanon uh, and we used to store or display a lot of the works there. Some of the photography uh, is, stored at my, is shown at my husband's offices, but there's a lot in storage, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, to not feel guilty about also having works in storage, we try to really rehang as much as we can and we loan a lot to museums. Um, and 
all I can say, oh, there's one more thing. We've also noticed that a lot of the artists in that collection were women. And th th this did not happen by design. It was a pure coincidence. One day we were all sat around the table looking at the works and tallying them. And we realized that uh, more than half were uh, women artists. And I was very pleased, not because I'm a woman, but because I personally feel that women have that extra sort of, we, we have that wavelength, let's call it, whereby we can, we are a little bit more sensitive because of the many role that women uh, embody, the many hats that we wear. A woman is not only your mother, but your sister, your lover, a homemaker, and, and many, many more. So this is a little bit about um, ICEL. Um, now, how does, uh, how does ICELF engage with the public uh, communities? Because this is the, the role of, uh, or the topic of today's talk. Um, I, we have always opened our home for talks, uh, for events, uh, but in 2017, I was approached by Ivona Blazwick the director of the Whitechapel Gallery. And uh, for those who don't know what the Whitechapel Gallery is, of course, you all know, the Whitechapel Gallery is a public art gallery and it's the oldest gallery uh, in London. It's 120 years old. And Ivona asked me if I would accept to show my collection at the gallery. They have on the first floor uh, two rooms that they call Gallery 7. And in these rooms, they show personal or interesting art collections that haven't been shown to the public before. So I said yes, after consulting with my husband. And uh, it was a very humbling, but also very scary moment because sharing your collection with a smaller audience is one thing at your house, in your home, but sharing it uh, with a bigger audience and on a wider level is a totally different thing. Especially that you have to surrender all your database to the Whitechapel curators. They have to pick the pieces that they want to show and you have to trust them fully. You don't have a say in what goes on display. They show you what they have chosen just before opening day, but you cannot decide what goes on display or not. And then the second thing is you have to be ready to accept criticism because a lot of visitors walk in, uh, you organize events around it. And then the press came on press night. They looked at the works, they looked at the themes because what the Whitechapel Gallery curators did was that they created four themes. So it, the, the exhibition was divided into four chapters and uh, each chapter would last for about four months. And for each chapter, they would change um, the works. Uh, on opening night, and I'll share a few images with you. On opening night, I was actually quite, um, I was a bit scared, I will not lie to you, but the minute I walked into the gallery and I saw how the curators had displayed the work, I remember that I breathed and it was a sigh of relief um, because I still wanted the works to reflect who I was. My collection is a domestic collection, but it was built with love. Every piece has a story. I don't just go and I buy with my heart. It's true, I don't buy with my ears and with my eyes. But again, when you put your babies on display, uh, you have to be ready to accept uh, feedback. So I will share a few images and I promise you it won't be long. Um, there you go. Can you see? Hope you can. Yeah, good. So um, that's the opening uh, day. And this is the door of the Whitechapel Gallery, Gallery 7. And uh, this is... Uh, chapter one. So chapter one was called Self-Portrait as Billy the Goat. Billy the Goat is this artwork uh, by Polish sculptor Pavel Altamer. 
Um, and the theme uh, looked at how artists outline personal identity through personal portraiture by staging their own bodies or self -re reflections as the primary subject. They examine the mechanisms we use to present ourselves to the world, questioning where our inner and external realities meet. There's a work by Louise Bourgeois, and this is an infinity net by Yayoi Kusama. So these are a few images by, on the opening night, Gilbert and George, and the lovely Ivona Blaswick talking. This is Three Horizontals by Louise Bourgeois, and another Louise Bourgeois just behind it. And these are four works by, uh, ooh, sorry, Collector's Brain Fog. This is chapter two, and chapter two was called The End of Love, and it looked at how artists examine how individuals relate to the wider society, specifically in material terms, and, and how do we relate to others through portraiture and dialogue. So this is Akram Zateri to portraits, and this is uh, Maria Lasnik, Chantal Joff, and Mary Kelly. And more portraits from chapter two. Chapter three was called the upset bucket and it examined how individuals related to the wider society in material terms and how people project a sense of identity through their appearances and their consumer choices. And chapter four is called bumped bodies and I only have this slide and it's uh, about the relationship between the body, objects, and the environment, and questioning our sense of physical and material cohesion. And this is me and my younger son at the time before the exhibition closed. Um, now, having looked at, finished the uh, Whitechapel exhibition made me think a lot about what to do next. And it encouraged me uh, to think about other ways to share my collection and use it in a more meaningful way. And during COVID, I had the chance to work with the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital on a completely different charity project. But then I was introduced to their uh, art therapy department and I was invited to volunteer in that department. And I thought that this is a new venture I'd like to explore. So as part of the volunteering and working with, uh, um, with young adolescents who have mental health issues, I thought that organizing a place or a center where I could share uh, some of my artwork with these young children uh, would give them a chance to uh, interact with the art um, and help them uh, in their healing journey. So this is my next project. It's still in its early days and I'm still still working on it. It's, um, it's very new, very young, but I thought I, I would share it with you. Um, so art therapy is going to be the next chapter um, in my life. Um, thank you for listening to me, and I hope you liked my presentation. Maria, it was beautiful and touching. I think this uh, human side of you, it is beautiful. Thank so you. thank you, really. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you and, and uh, you know, and say, you know, very simply, really how to is to be an art collector and uh, and uh, and also what is around and um, beautiful grazie <laughs> so i will go jump to georgina that she's been super super uh, wonderful if i may say so uh, to wait uh, with us today in in um, georgina I, I would love to speak to about your thought provoking book on the 
rise and rise of private uh, art museums. You've been, you've been uh, over 50 private spaces around the entire world in the last uh, months. So please let, let us uh, know just a bit of a glimpse if you can. So thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here and it's a real pleasure to have listened to your various speakers. I feel quite modest to come at the end and I won't take very much time because uh, you know time has gone by. But I was particularly interested in um, Kat uh, Katrin, sorry, I didn't know the name. I thought that it was a very interesting experience to share because I think that public-private partnerships are extremely interesting from this, from the point of view of the private museum. So the, the, the public, sorry, the private art museum. So the reason I wrote the book was that I had already visited 50, more than 50 private museums before COVID struck and I had intended to visit many more and then of course I couldn't. Um, but I was very interested in what was happening um, why was it that I think more private museums have been built in the last century than all the time before? So it's a real phenomenon of our times and I wanted to know more. And I thought it was terribly interesting what Carolyn said uh, about this problem of having lent works to museums and then never to see them on display. And one of the things that I wrote about and, and wrote a lot about was why is it that collectors today prefer to build their own museums? In Carolyn's case, it was she decided not to do it. Um, but why they build their own space, why they don't form some sort of a partnership or donate or lend on long term loans to um, to existing state institutions. Obviously, in America, it's a bit difficult, different because the uh, the, the, the description of a museum there is different from what we're used to in Europe, where they tend to be state funded, they tend to be private funded in America. But nevertheless, nobody thinks of the Met as being a private museum. Um, so you can talk about state institutions or state helped institutions because of their not for profit status and their charity status. And I think that this fear, this, this lack of losing control was one of the one was one of the things that really came out strongly, even though we talked about Han Nevkin um, just a moment ago, and that's one of the things he said he he buys for museums, but he does keep a little bit of control because he doesn't want works of art to disappear. So on top of that, at the moment, what we do have is that we have publicly funded museums under considerable stress at the moment because they've got big stress of their funding. I mean, it's a real disaster. COVID has been a disaster. They also have got all these questions about diversity. Are they showing, and this Nana talked about, um, are they really reflecting the population they want to attract, you know, or are they still tending to show pictures that are pictures and art that is now looking a bit, limited it's european it might be white it might be by white people male people so where are the women where are the where are the newer voices and this of course a private art space is more nimble um, and able perhaps to react more quickly and i think that's an interesting going forward and this is something that sylvain levy talked about and that was really interesting how are state institutions, state sponsored institutions, state funded institutions going to, to, to adapt. And here the private museum is much better placed to adapt more quickly and they're more nimble. And, but on the other hand, they don't have the same, um, they don't have, because they're publicly funded, certainly in Europe, um, they have to serve the population. Uh, a private museum owner can do more what he or she likes, which is quite interesting. Um, they can refine the collection, they can do lots of different things. So there's a real tension going on at the moment between the private and the public sectors. And in addition, a lot of private museums have been built by people with enormous resources and they can outbid. Uh, publicly funded museums, and this is also problematic, you know, when somebody like Eli Broad can spend a hundred million dollars on a single work of art, that's out of the question for a publicly funded museum. So it's a really interesting topic, 
And I'm going to end because I said I wasn't going to talk for long. It's at the end of the end of a very interesting seminar, but it's been quite long. Is is a question of, of the future. And I thought that that was very interesting, something that Sylvain said. He said, um, the most difficult thing is to last. And um, I thought that was interesting because the last chapter of my book is about the legacy. What happens when the founder of these private museums passes on? Will the successors have the same taste for a start? Because very often you don't have the same taste. And we mustn't forget that in contemporary art and most museums, private museums today are contemporary art museums purely because of supply. Um, will, it's, it's a question of fashion as well. You in order to remain contemporary, you have to keep buying. Will the successors of a private museum today have the interest, the taste and the money and the desire to continue the work of the founder? And I think that this question of legacy and sustainability is another crucial aspect of, of the private museum today. And of course, we can't know, we, we can't know what's going to happen. Um, so uh, it, was, it was an interesting book to write. It was not as thorough as I'd hoped because of COVID, but there you go. Most people said they might write a book during, lo during lockdown, and I did actually write a book during lockdown. So thank you so much for having me. And Carolina, thank you so much for giving us such an interesting uh, seminar. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you again for, 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 to all of you for being here and to give all this, uh, share your amazing art projects between uh, art collection, books, and, uh, and more uh, about this world that is going every day. Yes, as uh, Georgina and, and Sylvain, it's uh, how to stay and how to, to continue. That's, uh, that's a, gal a bit of Galleria Continua <laughs> <laughs> to, to come. But thank you again for being with us all this uh, one hour, I think, more, maybe more. And uh, again, it was, Fascinating to hear all your our talk. Thank you. Goodbye and good evening, and hopefully see you very soon again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For being with us tonight. Grazie, oh, Beatrice. Grazie, you. Valentina. Grazie, yeah. Maria e Georgina. Grazie, eh, Carolina, per l'invito e alla yeah. prossima. It was really beautiful to have you all here.